I'm Thomas Rutz, and this is my serial killer documentary. So let's start off by talking about what is a serial killer. So the United States Bureau of Justice Statistics defines serial killing as the killing of several victims in three or more separate events. And Oxford Languages defines a serial killer as a person who commits a series of murders often with no apparent motive and typically following a characteristic predictable behavior pattern. Oxford defines a psychopath as a person suffering from chronic mental disorder with abnormal or violent social behavior. And their definition of a sociopath is a person with a personality disorder manifesting itself in extreme antisocial attitudes and behavior and a lack of conscience. So, a psychopath doesn't have a conscience, or in other words, the, uh, the, the little voice in their head telling them right from wrong. And a soci sociopath does have a conscience, but it is weak. And there is a voice telling them what, is, what they're doing is wrong, but it doesn't stop them from what they're doing. So, antisocial personality disorder is a personality disorder characterized by persistent, antisocial, irresponsible, or criminal behavior, often impulsive or aggressive, with disregard for any harm or distress caused to other people and an inability to maintain long-term social and personal relationships. Next, I want to get into the whole argument of nature versus nurture. Is one's behavior influenced more by genetic or environmental factors? And to kind of explain that, I have a short YouTube clip that I'm going to play for you guys. Meet Lucky Lyle and Trouble Tim. Now, you might think they look a lot alike. That's because they're identical twins. But imagine them being raised in completely different environments. As adults, they turn out very differently. Lucky Lyle is a model citizen. He goes to work, pays his taxes, treats others well, and gets an education. Trouble Tim is on a different path. He robs banks, doesn't pay taxes, and gets his first prison sentence at the same time as Lyle gets his diploma. Their genes are identical, so it must be their separate environments that have made them so different, right? Well, there's more to it than that. Much more. We need to rewind a bit in time. You see, one of the great questions of humanity is, what makes us us? Huh. Early explanations had a hint of the supernatural about them. As the centuries whizzed by, science emerged and fought a tough battle to gain credibility. Eventually, social science emerged with the popular theory that our environment is what makes us us. Let's call this nurture. Undaunted, the biological sciences presented another theory. Genes. An unchangeable blueprint in you from birth decides everything. Let's call this one nature. So, are we a product of our genes or of our environment? The battle raged on. Observations in a newer field of study suggest that both are partly right. This field is called epigenetics. It means above genetics and has to do with how nature and nurture interact. At the heart of this discussion is one simple question asked by researcher Michael Meany. What makes a good rat mama? Well, for a rat mother, nothing says love and care like some nice, vigorous licking. The higher the number of legs, the more love and the better the mama. With this in mind, the researchers compared two groups of rat mothers, one that licked their babies a lot and another that didn't. They found that when babies grew up, they carried their mama's behavior with them and passed it on to the next generation and the next one and so on. But could it simply be that this particular group of rats was genetically predisposed to produce caring mothers? Well, to test this, the researchers took newborn babies from low-licking mothers and fostered them with high-licking mothers and vice versa. It turns out that if the mother is a high-licker, the rat baby becomes a high-licker too, regardless of whether it's genetically related to her or not. So genes 
really don't have anything to do with it then? In true scientific fashion, the researchers dove right into the brains of these rats to see what, if anything, was different in the brains of the babies of high-licking versus low-licking mothers. When they looked at genes that possibly play a role in motherly care, they found crucial differences. Newborn rat babies have clusters of molecules called methyl groups attached to these genes. These methyl groups silence the gene, effectively switching it off. The researchers discovered that while the methyl groups in rats from low-licking mothers were still attached, in the rats from high-licking mothers, these methyl groups had disappeared. This was also true for the rats that had been adopted by high-licking rat mothers. The care these rats received from their mothers actually physically altered their genetic expression. Now that's all fine and good for rats, but what about people? Well, the same is true for Lucky Lyle and Trouble Tim. And for you and me. The genes you're born with are the genes you've got. But lifestyle and environmental influences such as nutrition, exercise, smoking, stress, and love greatly affect your biology. These changes can actually be observed at the DNA level. The bright side is that epigenetic changes happen throughout our lives, and our choices can make real differences in how we develop as human beings. After watching that video, I still wasn't satisfied and went looking for more answers. So I went on to Google and I typed, are some of us born evil into the search bar? And I came across an article titled, are some of us born murderers or made into them? This article began with the explanation of the killer gene. This gene is a mutation of the MAO-A gene a sex-linked gene carried on the X chromosome. So this mutated gene is more often found in males because they have X and Y chromosomes, whereas females have both X chromosomes. And the MAO-A gene is often diluted out. The main function of the MAO-A gene is to break down serotonin. With the mutated MAO-A gene, the the breakdown doesn't occur, causing a surplus of serotonin. This constant serotonin surrounding the brain causes the calming effects that serotonin should bring to be non-existent. So activities that are normally rewarded with the calming effect of serotonin are negated. This then causes someone to be more prone to anger, violence, and the inability to control their emotions. The article then went on to explain the case of a boy who was abandoned at a daycare center and then adopted into a loving family who did nothing but provide the child with all he needed to succeed in life. However, at a very young age, he started to struggle with controlling his emotions, and when he was only 10 years old, he was abusing alcohol. Then at 11, he burglarized a home, and later on in his life, at the age of 20, he stabbed his friend to death and went to prison. Then, after escaping prison, he committed another murder. The boy's biological father had a criminal record and also killed two people. And even farther down the line, the boy's biological grandfather was also a murderer. So even after being raised in the perfect environment, the boy was unable to fight what was truly inside him. And this is a true story of a man named Jeffrey Landrigan. And with that being said, I believe that the outcome of a person does depend on both nature and nurture. However, I believe the side of nature is more responsible for the outcome than nurture is, especially with the case of who I'm going to begin to talk about, Amarjeet Sada. Amarjeet Sada, born in 1998 in the Begusaraya district of Bahir in India, was brought up in an extremely poor family that moved to the Mushahari village and spent a majority of their days in poverty. Amarjeet's father was a penniless farmer and his mother tended to the children at home. At the age of seven, Amarjeet took his first life. 
and it happened to be his eight-month-old sister. He took his sleeping baby sister from his mother's lap and went out to a deserted field and came back without her. After his return, his family members questioned where his little sister was, and Amarjeet took them out to the field to show them his sister's dead body covered in grass and dry leaves. Not long after his first murder, Amarjeet took another family member's life. This time, it was the son of Amarjeet's uncle, his six-year-old cousin. Both these killings were kept secret by the family in hope to protect the troubled boy. But Amarjeet Sada's dark secrets were brought to the light when he took the life of his third victim. This time, it was his neighbor's six-month-old daughter named Kushbu. Kushbu's mother had dropped her off at a local daycare, and when she returned, the baby girl was gone. And by that time, it was too late. Amarjeet did the same to her as his two prior victims. The already suspicious villagers were convinced after the murder of Kushbu, and authorities came to question the eight-year-old killer. The police asked him what happened, but all Amarjeet did was smile and ask for biscuits. So they gave him biscuits and asked again. He confessed to taking the victims out to deserted fields and bashing their faces in with a brick until they were no longer breathing. He would then cover their bodies with grass and dried leaves. Amarjeet Sada's name and face were published by the media despite his young age. The doctors who examined the boy claimed that he had a defect in his brain that led to a chemical imbalance which led to increased gratification from inflicting pain on others. He was officially diagnosed with a conduct disorder claimed to be hereditary and led him to com commit acts of violence because he had no sense of right or wrong. The doctors also declared his mental illness could be solved through, through medication and therapy. Amarjeet was put into a juvenile center until he was 18. He may have been released to go on and live a normal life, or he could still be committing similar acts to this day. He would now be 22 years of age. After researching the topic, I have come to the conclusion that a killer's actions are caused by nature more than nurture. No matter what an eight-year-old child has gone through, nothing could possibly happen in their life to cause them to do such horrific actions as these. To take the life of your baby sister, little cousin, and also your neighbor's baby daughter, your brain cannot possibly be wired correctly. Some people try and say that the boy was framed because he couldn't have gone into such detail and put in so much effort when hiding the bodies. However, when asked, Amarjeet was excited to show off the bodies and knew of their exact locations. Also, the way he just sat with a sadistic smile while explaining what he had done was enough to prove that he is not only the culprit, but also the world's youngest serial killer. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope you enjoyed my serial killer documentary.